Hey guys, what's up? Eddie Ajo here with KissAnalog.com and guess what? I burned up this old Fosse amplifier. It's a little dude. Man, look how small it is. It's crazy. Um, the specs and all that stuff that it has. Now one thing right off the bat, we know it, the specs say 100 watt plus 100 watts, right? Well, when I look, read a little closer, it says 100 watts max. Kind of reminds me back in the old days when, you know, car amplifiers and all that stuff. You know, home audio used to be that way and they kind of fixed it. But now, it's kind of coming back where people call max power. And I remember it got so crazy they would call max power is actually peak to peak max power. And I mean, it just got really crazy. But anyway, yeah, so max power I think is what they call peak power. I think that's what they mean. RMS power is going to be at least half that, right? So, so that said, yeah, the specs don't really line up with our expectations. But, I mean, you know, that's if you expect the specs to be correct. Um, looking at the power supply for this thing, it only puts out just over 100 watts. So there's no way you can put out 100 watts continuous into two channels, right? So... At the most, 100% efficiency, you're around 50 watts per channel. It's probably more like 36 watts per channel if it can get that. But my testing in that video, it was really weird. Uh, the waveforms kind of look funny. And, you know, it was it's just a bonehead move that I made. And uh, it's just funny how sometimes when I'm doing a video, I'm so caught up in thinking about all the different things that my battery's charging my microphone the camera you know and, and all these lights and all this other stuff sometimes I I get caught up in this stuff and, and I'm kind of excited about playing with a new instrument whatever and and it's like the lights don't go on <laughs> like then afterwards I look at it and I'm like oh man that that seemed kind of obvious anyway the thing is is you know, I usually check myself at the bench before I apply power, especially from an input to an output. I ohm it out, which I did. So I ohmed the speaker negatives to the RCA jack, and they were, and I had good continuity there. So then I actually ohmed it to the negative of the uh, 24 volt supply coming in, had continuity there. So that's the part that I'm still a little bit. Well, not a little bit. That's the part that I'm so confused about. How did I get continuity between those? Because as uh, I'm going to put his name here, I forget. Uh, he pointed out, and I was like, oh yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, the, they're bridge tied loads. So you have two transistors on one side switching on and off the current, kind of like a push-pull stage like on that Class A amplifier. And then you have another set doing the same thing, and they're 180 degrees out of phase. So one transistor up in this corner is pulling the signal up, and on this side where you have two transistors, that bottom transistor is pulling down, so you're stretching the signal this way, comes back to zero, stretches it this way. That makes sense to you. So what that means is that uh, the plus terminal is tied in between two transistors it's a bridge so there's four transistors okay tied together and this plus gets tied between the center of two of these transistors on one side the negative gets tied to the center of two transistors on the other side so that's how between the four transistors you, know, you got four transistors right here right and Top and bottom turn on, they turn off, top and bottom turn on. So when you have a sine wave, it does this kind of thing, you know? And so you don't have a ground. You don't, you, you kind of do have a ground. The filtering on these things, they'll do this common mold filtering where the ground's the common point. It's not common to the speakers. You know, the speakers are tied, so they're isolated from each other. Plus, minus, the minus, on each speaker has uh, it's there's there's no tie between them each speaker has four transistors and the speakers tied between those four like that okay so um, I probably 
I'll show you, you know what, I'm going to show you a data sheet so you can see what I'm talking about and I'll point it out. But, um, and you know, it's like I've I've done so many Class D amps, I, sh I should just know that. But this thing's so small, I didn't. I didn't know if they would use cause, so to have a left and right channel you have to have two chips and I guess I didn't think that they had two chips in there which they do which is pretty amazing that they stuck two of the TI chips in there the 3116 chips I guess I assumed they had one chip and they weren't tied in a bridge tied configuration it was two you know two transistors tied to the ground I guess I was just assuming that I never really thought it through honestly and I did check with the ohmmeter. I remember thinking like, okay, uh, how are these tied? I want to make sure I have them tied. So before I, because once I tie my audio analyzer, now the, the way I tied it, that's another thing. Being kind of lazy and be quick. And it actually works pretty well. I take the plus, there, there's there's actually a plus minus a differential input and, uh, for both the input and the output. So I can use both of these connections so it's kind of like using a scope, where you use two scope probes to tie across, say, an, uh, say something like this, and you don't use the grounds, or you tie the grounds together. They're already tied together on the scope, but you you tie, you tie use two scope probes to get a differential probe. But I have a bunch of differential probes back here, so I'm so used to using differential probes. I could have used a differential input for both the input reading and the output reading on this, but... I was using the alligator clips on one and I thought that was going to be good enough and usually it is but and so I ohmed them to make sure they had this right that they're all grounded together and it looked like they were that's the part I'm still confused about is how did I see continuity between those things unless it was already pre-failed or something which is possible I guess but Man, for this thing to run as long as it did, uh, you know, either pre-failed or or doing what I was doing is pretty actually remarkable. So you got to hand it to these little TI chips and this Fosse Audio amplifier to hang in there as long as they did under uh, poor measurement conditions. <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah. I guess, well, you know, another, making excuses here for myself. Another thing I'm doing this late at night when I get home. I work uh, 10 hour days plus have to drive, you know, half hour back and forth to work. So I'm gone 11 hours, get home, have dinner. And so it's a pretty long day by the time I get in here. So hit the like button, even though I screwed up on this. I'm pretty sure I screwed up. I had to have. Um, so... Yeah, these chips are pretty rugged. They're thermally protected. They're over. They have all kinds of over protections, but and you know, I've never hooked one up wrong like that before. <laughs> if I had, I wouldn't have done it twice. I hope. But anyway, I've never done that before, and I I think what I would have expected is that for there to be an immediate issue, you know, not for it to work as long as it did before it finally. Uh, gave up so and I think the reason why it did is because the input on this for the TI chip I believe is differential is uh, uh, even though they're using RCA jacks which is kind of interesting I think I'm gonna I'm gonna we're gonna go in here and take a look but I think they're hooked up as if it's like an XLR input like a differential input meaning that each the plus and minus are going into the op amp or into the drive circuitry equally they're they're not looked at as a plus and a ground they're looked at as a plus and a minus and uh and so um essentially a balanced input is what i'm saying i guess but even though they're rca jacks which are single-ended inputs meaning one end's tied to ground i believe the way this chip works well, I know the way the chip works is it's differential input. And uh, if they followed through with that, maybe that's how it would have worked. Because as I tied them plus, you know, the grounds together on the input and the output, which would have uh, 
it would have made some weird measurements and that's why I might have been seeing these weird measurements because my ground on the output would have been tied to would have essentially uh, bypassed the to the bridge on one side I would have been tied to the ground down here because it's plus and ground where the two transistors so I would have been tied to the ground on this side and to the center of the transistors on this side and I would have been tying that ground on the input to the input. But if the input, all, all it was doing is I was forcing it to be referenced to that same point. Which, it's it's really crazy. I would have never thought how that would have worked. But, so maybe it's neat that I kind of did that by accident. Because now I'm going to look into that to see how that actually worked. And how it didn't just cause a failure right out of the gate. Uh yeah so it's perplexing <laughs> what i want to do though after all that gibberish is i, I want to show you the day sheet just to show you what i'm talking about but i want to open this guy up and see what died okay and uh so let's do that so you know if you still trust me what I want to do is I'm going to talk about how to troubleshoot, you know, how to how to start troubleshooting something and kind of the method that I use, uh, that I use on the job and that I've, you know, trained other people, other engineers and technicians how to do. I mean, and I, I might have learned some of these techniques from some of those people over the years. But anyways, uh, first of all, this guy has a solid blue light right now. You can't see it from there, I'm, I know, but has a solid blue LED. This is a power supply for this. This is the one that I believe is 106, 108 watts. It's 24 volts times 4.5 amps, whatever wattage that is. That's the maximum output wattage of this thing, okay? So, uh, you really need a little higher voltage, I, I feel like. And part of looking inside this is we're going to kind of determine how big of a, you know, how much voltage you can actually feed one of these with. I know they came out the pro version that has the big gold knob. It's a little different, you know, slightly different. But the main thing was they came out with, well, I think, is they came out with the, uh, I believe it was like 32 or 36 volts power supply for it. So we're going to see, since we're going into this thing, we're going to see what possible improvements we can make by as far as getting output power. Now the thing is, is, you know, you might be limited on temperature, how much how much heat you can dissipate in this. So if you put a bigger brick on it, maybe this thing's going to get too hot. Okay, so that's bench testing. So that would be a bench test concern. But in real music, I would like to have the, uh, the range of higher voltage before clipping. Uh, because real music's not going to put out the kind of dissipation as a constant sine wave like I'm doing here at the bench, which, you know, some audio people call bench testing. Uh, bench testing is much more severe than real music. So, there's that. And, uh, but, you know, so looking at the day sheet, looking inside this thing, we're going to see what the real limitations are. It might be the voltage rating of the capacitors in here. It could be, yeah, we're going to look at see what op amps they have in here, too. Okay, so I think on the Pro version that has a bigger knob, the bigger power supply, I think they also added sockets for the op amp so that you can swap them out. Um, something like this, I don't know how meaningful that is, but, but I hear some people really like to do that. So, all right, sorry for this long introduction, but when I saw the failure, that blue light was blinking. So I turned off this switch and I thought that would have done a hard turnoff, and it didn't. It did not, which made me think like, wow, I, I thought this was because it's a mechanical toggle switch. I thought, and because it's a low voltage input, I thought that would have, this power would have came to that switch first and it would have cut off everything. But I still had a short, even after I disconnected this. So I, so this blue light was blinking, telling me that it was an overcurrent. And so what this guy would do is he'd go into like a hiccup mode and he would say, whoa, fault, overcurrent, shut down power. And then he'd wait a moment, maybe a second, maybe less, 
turn back on again to try to reboot, you know, using software terms. But anyway, he would try to hiccup, try to come back up, and he would see the fault, go back into fault mode, and so you'd see the light blink on and off, which I, I, I did see that. So, so that's a bit of good information. We know that this guy, and when I disconnected, this guy physically disconnected it. When I turned off the switch, it was still blinking. I'm like, what the heck? So when I physically disconnected, it went solid. I'm like, okay. I wasn't sure if that light was always blinking or not. I don't, couldn't remember. So I thought, oh, well, maybe it is a blinking light. But when I pulled, removed it, it stopped blinking. I'm like, wow, that's disappointing. I, I would have liked to have a real mechanical switch versus you know, a soft switch where you push a button, you know, the thing's in hibernation, you hit the button, it turns on. Kind of like this Siglent scope back here, that's the way that works. My GW Instec up there, it's got a hard switch. When I hit it, it physically shuts down. So, I mean, you electrically break the connection, which I like that because if there is a transient that comes to the power line for some reason, stormy day, something like that, if you turn off the switch, you kind of hope to protect your stuff. But if it's just a soft switch, it's just it's just basically triggering an enable pin on a chip that says, oh yeah, shut down, pretend we're off. But it's still sitting there waiting. But in that last test, when I turned on the switch and we saw that, that spike, when I turned it off, we saw that spike. Uh, that's those thumps you would probably hear. Um, and you know what? That, uh, that could have, those thumps uh, could have been due to my bad connections. So I'm going to have to repair this, get it working again, and then we'll have to retest and see if those thumps, because I was a little surprised that no one had complained about that with the Fosse. So again, yeah, some, if the light had gone on or something, maybe I would have rechecked things and figured out, figured out my problem. But yeah, I, I think, anyway, there you go. Bonehead. <laughs> so, sometimes you do that stuff, right? So, all right, guys. All right, guys. So, I just want to say, basically, this is like an apology video to Fosse because I don't want to give them bad uh, a bad image or bad publicity. So, I'm trying to put this video out real quick after my last video to take responsibility for you know, me blowing it up. In my last video, I did say I blew it up. So I was, you know, I was trying not to drag them through it. But at the same time, I was showing bad measurements and so on. And I'm sure the, the distortion, I'm amazed that it worked as well as it did. That, that blows me away. I still got to investigate that. How did that happen? How did it work as well as it did? And as long as it did. <laughs> well, compliments at Texas Instruments for having... A good chip, that 3116, and uh, compliments Fosse for putting two of them in this th little teeny device. And uh, even though it won't put out 100 watts per channel, like they say, that is it does say max power. So just you know, be pre-warned. Whenever you see max power, know that that's not average power. Average power is going to be less than half that. At least I'm sure, no more than half that at least. Okay. So, all right, guys, um, I'm going to do a little troubleshooting video on this, bring the camera over, break it down, and just kind of walk you through the board and how it's designed and uh, all that stuff in the next video. This video just has too much talking. It's mostly something I want to get out quickly. So, hopefully the title was representative of what this video was all about. <laughs> all right, guys. Whew, a little embarrassing, you know. I, I actually pride myself as an engineer who doesn't have a lot of failures in the lab because I think through things a lot and you know, do a lot of simulations, do a lot of stuff, and I rarely knock on wood. Uh, you know, rarely have things blow up in the lab, but it does happen. A lot. Yeah, especially blows up a lot more. Honestly, it really does blow up a lot more in my own lab than it does at work. <laughs> I guess in my own lab, I. Not, I'm a little bit more rushed and, yeah, not as careful as I am at work. But, huh, I got to think about that one, I guess. Uh, anyway, sorry, Fosse. 
wasn't your fault mine uh, thanks guys for watching and uh, yeah sorry about the last video um, and I'm gonna put the name of the guy who pointed that out to me and it was like a light going on in my head going oh crap I did open this up to look to see if there's two chips in there um, because if there's two chips they can do that bridge tie load kind of thing they call it bridge tie load and if not and anyway whatever okay um, I'm gonna show you this little kit I opened it up and then I thought oh I should have just showed you guys this little kit this is Pike uh, pick quick this is a Canadian tool it's freaking amazing especially when you need small tools big tool anyway I bought my first one of those probably 30 years ago um, a long time ago I think it's probably longer than that I think it was when they first opened when they first came out and uh, so I bought this kit on Amazon and anyway we'll talk about it next video I'll put a link down below for cool tools appreciate I appreciate you guys using my links down below and appreciate all my patrons and uh, yeah I appreciate all you guys watching the video uh, if you like the video that's a free way to support it use the links that helps it doesn't cost you anything to support the channel that way either you become a patron for as little as a dollar a month watch me blow up things like bonehead and uh, um, yeah <laughs> All right, thanks guys. Oh, and there's a super thank you button. Buy me a cup of coffee. Maybe that'll keep, you know, maybe a little caffeine keep me from doing this stuff. <laughs> all right, just hit the like button. That's all you need to do. Thanks guys. Appreciate you watching. See you next time.